I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to a Saturday edition of Conversations with Al McFarland. This is unique and new and uh, as always fun. Uh, usually I do these interviews Monday through Friday, but we have the uh, good fortune and the opportunity to do the program in seven days a week for the rest of this month. And that's due to a request that I made of the Minnesota Health Department and its COVID-19 initiative. They have uh, underwritten and supported the uh, special programming that we're doing today for the next uh, so many days through the end of the year. And the mission is to have uh, what I'm calling uh, COVID-19 uh, town hall meeting, talking to organizations, agencies, individuals, leaders, government officials at the state, county, city level, and neighborhood organizations that are involved with COVID-19 awareness, prevention, mitigation uh, policy. And so today I'm pleased to have two uh, esteemed leaders in community to be part of the conversation. Uh, Alfred Babington Johnson leads the Stair Step Foundation, the Stair Step Initiative. And uh, Brother Babington and I go back a, a long, long ways uh, as community builders, as community uh, leaders, uh, servants of community, uh, people committed to the development and the dignity of our people and all human beings. And Tony Santa leads the Tony Santa Foundation, a phenomenal youth serving, family serving organization in St. Paul. Uh, Tony is a world-class athlete having been on the world stage in soccer. Uh, great story, a great man, and uh, one living out a great commitment to the uh, health and well-being of our families and our community. Well, both of you, I've engaged to ask you to talk about what you are doing, what we are doing together to uh, apprise and support our community's ability to navigate through the COVID-19 crisis. I wanna introduce you both to my colleague, Brenda Gray. Brenda Gray is a columnist and uh, writer for Insight News, and she's also an educator. Uh, and she'll be joining me on these uh, sessions throughout the balance of the month. But Brother Babington, why don't you unmute first and good, good morning, good afternoon. How are you doing, man? I'm doing nicely, my brother. And it's always a pleasure to see you and engage that extraordinary intellect. Well, uh, thank you for that. I'll accept that as a compliment. I'll accept the compliment. Uh, uh, you know, I feel the same way about you all the time. Uh, we have a wonderful and rich, meaningful conversation. But let's jump right in. Uh, COVID-19, uh, how is it affecting our community as you see it? And what have you, what are we doing to rise to the challenge to do what we've always done? And that is to be a light, to be a support, to be a guide for our community towards health and wholeness uh, and uh, sustainability. Amen. Well, clearly uh, as 2020 arrived, uh, I don't think any of us envisioned the overlay <laughs> That, was, that is now to be known as the pandemic or the arrival of COVID-19. So we as a community, we're facing all the traditional challenges Al, that we have <laughs> struggled with and against for decades. Um, but, but now comes this um, accelerant in some ways uh, and, uh, and clarifier <laughs> in some ways the challenge of COVID-19, because as it landed, of course, all of the discrepancies and the, uh, and the malformations uh, came into stark relief against the backdrop of this thing. Um, and then of course, uh, I think we would be negligent if we didn't also uh, recognize the, the impact of the, of the intense conversation about racial justice uh, that occurred out of the televised execution of George Floyd. So mm -hmm. here we are <laughs> in, in this, this time with all of the maladies, but now with these new challenges of the intensification of the discussion around racial justice, but now the, the, the danger, the hazard uh, health-wise is being presented by COVID-19, which nobody understood to begin with, um, and, and the, the clarity of it, of course, has evolved over time. So, so Al, uh, it would be uh, redundant to say this has been challenging, mm -hmm. but uh, I think what you always uh, demonstrate for me, and I think what we also engaged is, uh, challenge is also opportunity. Mm -hmm. And um, 
So as this virus unfolded and all the dimensions of how it had to be dealt with were articulated, uh, one of the things was clear is there was gonna be a lot of economic impact, negative and positive mm -hmm. out of this thing. And for me, uh, the question was, well, uh, as we suffer the challenges of it, how do we also make sure that our community is participant in the, the, the economic benefits that might occur out of dealing with the thing? And so, uh, uh, that's where we went immediately. I, I don't know. I don't want to make it a soliloquy, but I don't you know. Maybe that's no, keep going. That's, that's the whole point of the conversation. And so the analysis, the, the, the way to look at it is critical. And you described a way to look at it, not as uh, a woe is me, not bemoaning and not uh, grabbing and, and staying fixated on the damage that is occurring in our community and around the world, but saying that there's something beyond that and something inside that out of which we must create opportunity to grow, to thrive, and to reshape uh, our presence, our, our, to create our victory. This is a, an opportunity for, for victory. So Absolutely. go on down that path, brother. Absolutely. And, and again, you model this so well. But um, so we are all of us on this journey with a sense of mission and desired outcomes. And the desired outcome for Stair Step is all about a, a, an invigorated uh, African-American community uh, that recognizes its historical strengths and presses with its current assets towards a better future. And so in pursuit of that, Al, you know, uh, we decided notwithstanding the fact that Stair Step is a secular entity, we, it was a born out of faith, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but one of the things that we recognized early on that a key instrumentality for our community was the African-American church. Mm -hmm. A key instrumentality, first of all, to recognize that if you wanna have change, it's okay to, to try to uh, save each starfish, if you will. But if you want meaningful change, you've gotta do it on an institutional basis. It's gotta be the creation of, of structures that are able to, to, to engage and sustain engagement going on. And so we recognized early on that the African-American church represented such an opportunity. And so beginning in 1995, we began to call together African-American pastors and congregations in something we now call His Works United. And it is the largest ecumenical gathering of African-American churches in the, in the state of Minnesota. We have a policy board that can that uh, consists of the president of the State Baptist Convention and the, uh, the jurisdictional predate of the Churches of God in Christ and the presiding bishop of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World and the president of the St. Paul Interdenominational Ministerial Alliance and the presiding elder of the AME Church. Really, the, the reach of our collaboration of churches is probably over 150 be and beyond, right? And so, so if we want to say the, 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 how do we as a community use this networking opportunity? And the metaphors around the, the church network would be one, a circulatory system, or two, a highway system. So with you know, the churches as nodes, so can we activate that in such a way that it serves the community intentionally? And so even with this COVID uh, situation, we immediately engaged the governor and the commissioner of health about how do we get to the table to provide service for our people, but not always in the volunteer mode. Right. How do we actually uh, recognize there's a lot of resources being spread. They should come to our churches and to our community. Uh, and so we, a couple of different things, Al. One is we initially had a, a, a network of over 50 African-American pastors throughout the state, including Rochester and uh, Duluth and St. Cloud, as well as the metropolitan area that we were able to engage on a monthly basis to come together to hear about COVID, to be able to then share accurate information into the community, if you will, and da, 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 da. And so we were able to do that with support from the uh, Department of Health for a period of time. Then we evolved into uh, a couple of other more specific areas. Right now, we have a, a field of what we call uh, community navigators. Mm -hmm. uh, we and other organizations do, but it's a group of folk that we are able to hire uh, at a reasonable rate of return 
uh, to actually engage regularly about COVID and its issues and man a uh, 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 community-based hotline. So if people are calling for, uh, for issues, whatever, we are one of those organizations that mans that hotline and actually then try, tries to steer people to uh, help informationally or, uh, or otherwise. The other thing, and I'll, I'll uh, uh, close, is that um, we also recognize the importance of contact tracing and case investigation. And uh, that's something that the state has been talking about for some time, but nothing that there was any active dialogue about how does the African-American community also participate in that. But we were able to break through and, and create a contractual relationship where we actually now are able to field a group of uh, uh, 22 case investigators, uh, contact tracers who are able to, to assist in mm -hmm. this process going forward. That's phenomenal. Thank you so much. We'll come back and talk more about uh, that specific work, uh, Brother Babington, but also I always want to remind people about the origin, the grand vision, and the mission of the Stair Step Initiative. We've done, done a lot of great things, and I think greater things still lie ahead. Uh, and so we'll talk about that. Uh, Brother Tony Santa, you are an inspiration. The Tony Santa Foundation is doing phenomenal work that I'm aware of in St. Paul. You may be doing things beyond St. Paul, but thank you for being here. And uh, 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 you know, let me ask you the same question. How do you approach uh, your community uh, connecting to and moving beyond responding to the threat of COVID-19, the pandemic? Oh, you have to unmute, unmute. Yes, thank you. Um, um, I'm honored to be here in, in the presence of everybody. And, um, you know, I've been blessed that I, I've always been connected by leaders um, that I feel have, have shown me um, what I would say is the path, but it ends up being the right path. Um, so I just want to thank you guys for, for both um, building the path for, for people like me and, and I'm trying to reproduce what you're already doing so that it is the norm um, of the next generation. So I really appreciate that. Um, I think right now it's, it's a challenging time for everybody. Um, and so we're really trying to connect to people. Um, and I think people need people and we have to be safe. And so the idea is how are we connecting, you know, spiritually, you know, Physically from afar, you know, we're not isolated um, um, species. So that, that interconnectedness is important. What are, what connects us all? Um, so we've 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 really tried to make everything we do relationship based. We've tried to reach out and partner with other communities. Um, we we found that we were very successful in food distribution because we were willing to go and find other partners. Um, but we also, because we really connected with the community that we work with, um, they found this is a place where they were comfortable coming to. I think one of the, the drawbacks is everyone thinks this is just because of COVID that, that people are starving in this country. I think COVID gave a lot of people the okay to go get free food, where I think a lot of people question their dignity if they had to go ask for food. So oftentimes we don't make it acceptable to ask for help. And everybody needs help in some kind. And I think we put you know, false values on, on what defines us, but we were able to get a lot of families feeling <laughs> to come here um, by making it easy, um, by making it about community. And, so COVID, COVID's been, been, been difficult for us. And, you know, I think the, the last major change we did is, you know, we've actually hired more people, people of color um, than we've ever had as a staff. We hired more young people, more people referred to the system who are keeping this economy going and keeping families healthy and safe. Um, so when we look what we value, you know, I have a lot of young brothers and sisters and refugees that are here feeding, you know, over a million pounds of produce they've done, you know, over a couple thousand people a week. Um, and, and they know that they're needed and they know that they're an integral part of this 
community and, and we need to honor them now and, and going forward because all they needed was opportunities. Um, you know, from the learning space, we've opened our gym into a giant classroom. So we have 100, 120 spaces, but we maximum can come in at 60 a day. It actually looks like a call center because there's glass pods everywhere. And we've actually hired mothers from the community um, to come in and, and, and other, other family members that have to go to work. You can send your kids here. Hmm. And I look at it as, you know, if you make $40,000, it's 3,300 a month. You know, that might be 25 after taxes, right? Um, and, you know, you take away $1,200, that's $1,200. You have left $1,300 left after your rent, you know, 500 after your bills. And even the, you know, the Y is $40 a day. Um, and that's the most affordable childcare. So if you have two kids, you can't afford to go to work or leave your kids home. So families can come and just drop their kids off here. Um, which I think in the long term, you know, having kids not isolated is really important. And it's even showing what the divide is in this country. I mean, all the suburban people are taking their kids to private schools, creating these learning pods, hiring teachers. Um, and so letting our kids, you know, go to school and then let their parents work um, it is important. So I've just tried to, to the COVID to connect with as many people as I can. And honestly, I'm back in college right now. Mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm learning and trying to advance myself and trying to surround myself with, with individuals and leaders like yourself. Um, and I think if you're open with the idea of you want to help people and you're listening to learn with successful stories, you can make a big difference. Tony, do two things for me, if you would. Talk about the origin and the mission and vision of the Tony Santa Foundation, but then also talk about Tony Santa, because you've got a, a wonderful story that brings a smile to my, my face and to my heart every time I hear it. Uh, I'm so pleased to know you and to know about you, and uh, you tell the story better than anybody else. So, uh, And without, you know, I know you're a humble guy, I know that, but you got a lot to show and a lot to say. So tell people about Tony Santa, uh, your path in uh, professional athletics, and uh, then your movement towards the service that you're doing right now. Uh, yes, and I will, it's the Sane Foundation, and we've actually moved the soccer ball out of it. You can see our new logo, um, because we really want to focus on health disparities. So, um, you know, I, I was, I've always been blessed. My dad was from West Africa. My mom was from Wisconsin. Um, I was baptized in the Greek Orthodox Church. Um, they sent me to go live with my grandparents in Africa when I was six years old for three years. And I think what that did for me is I, I understood community. I understood where I came from, um, you know, and my dad was working. So for lack of a better word is I lived with strangers from the time I was six to eight. I traveled on a plane 26 hours at age six um, when there were no phones um, on a 42 hour journey. Um, and I was picked up by other people. I quickly learned that the world was full of love and, and that we have to help each other. And I was raised by, our, I like to say, 42 uncles. My mom was a social worker for 42 years. She stayed in child protection because of the 8% bonus. It was a three, three year burnout in her unit and she stayed for 28 years in the same unit because she needed the extra 8%. Um, and so I was raised by the community. Um, I was, it just was normal. People would pick me up, take me to get something to eat, take me to a sports camp. Um, and so that's how I grew up. So when I retired, I was gonna come back to Minnesota. And when I retired, I, I was a professional soccer player for 17 years. Um, I played in the World Cup and represented this country. And I lived in Europe for, for six years and played in the top leagues in the world there. So um, the game was very good to me and it's a part of my soul. Um, and when it came time to stop, I, I knew I had to give back through the sport. And the more I thought about it, I realized it wasn't the sport at all. It was the relationships. Um, I looked at some of my friends that were in prison or some of my friends that didn't make it. It's because somehow people always took care of me. And so I just wanted to build an organization where every young person had somebody for them built on relationships. And so it quickly evolved and everyone used to say, you're everywhere, Tony, you're scattered. Um, in 2018, we won this Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Award um, for making communities healthier. 
And that kind of tied it together. And so it helped me explain what internally we felt. We're making communities healthier. And the root cause of that is social justice, poverty, the alleviation of poverty. Only 20% of health outcomes are clinically clinical. So we're investing in, in, in people of color, in communities. And so our, our largest program, we put mentors in schools and try to get them their master's degree so they can become teachers, so that we have people that look like us on a daily basis. Um, we try to house those people um, to take away all the barriers um, so they can concentrate on one thing um, because we know that, that they have everything it takes. Um, then we have a community center where we have 26 languages spoken here. Um, we serve 36,000 meals a year before COVID. Now we've served over 500,000 individuals since it started. Um, and so it's, we don't, I can't tell you what we do here because it's driven by what the community wants. Mm -hmm. And then we have free summer camps um, where we hire over 100 high school kids and do week long camps, 100 of them across the metro area for 8,000 kids. Um, but the kids that are 14 to 18 get paid. The kids that are six to 12 go for free. Um, and the first thing they learn is, you know, making a new friend and it's not about the sports. And I go to camp and everyone's like, okay, what'd you learn? And it's never about soccer or basketball. It's always about like respect and, you know, how to make somebody feel good. So I'm proud of my staff that, that, that that's the culture that they've been able to build. I am, uh, I mean, I, I believe in what I do and I, I'm, you, you say I'm humble, but I know that I'm, I'm good at developing programming because I don't really develop programming. The secret is I go and look for leaders in the community that do stuff really well and I borrow it and I put my own brand on it because there's a lot of really good people that are doing really good stuff and we just need to, you know, keep that going and, and do it at scale. You're muted. You're muted. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm multitasking here too. But listen, that's a great story. I love it. Uh, Babington, what do you think? You know, I wanted to come back to you. And uh, I mean, as I'm listening to that, I know that uh, uh, your dad, Babington, I think is from the motherland. So kind of a similar story. And through you, I began to uh, develop my experiences and exposure to Africa, primarily in Ghana and then later in Uganda. Uh, and uh, that connection is an important one. And I, I loved hearing Tony talk about that. And Tony, it just brings me back to the protocols that I experienced uh, watching and being among uh, elders and chiefs uh, and uh, and. Um, government officials uh, in Ghana over several uh, times that I was there. And the protocol is what's important. You told me you had 42 uncles, right, in your neighborhood. And, and there was a way you have to approach them and the way they provided uh, both shelter and direction, a pathway for you. And you've taken that, brought that into your relationships of community building right now today. That's wonderful. Stair Step Foundation had the same intent and it delivered on that intent in creating a mentoring program that brought young black men from Minneapolis mentored with or paired with elders from Minneapolis that brought young black women paired with elders who were women in Minneapolis and St. Paul to uh, one to two week excursions uh, living uh, and visiting uh, throughout Ghana, West Africa. So uh, I, I'm one, I'm pleased for this, you know, cross in conversations, because both of them lead to this idea that you both have expressed about the need for us to understand the uh, economics of being, the economics of problem solving, and the economics of service. And you said, and I, it jumped out at me, you have kids that are 14 and older who get paid for camp, right? Uh, and Babington, one of the models for Stair Step has always been to create jobs for our people. So let me stop there and have you respond to that, if you would, Babington, first of all, by talking about the vision, the mission, the work you've done at the Stair Step movement, the Stair Step Institute, and the foundation. Amen. Uh, if I can just 
pop back to one thing yep. that I forgot in respect to the response to the COVID. Um, we have uh, we pressed the state to provide testing sites in the community operated by the community. And so we've had several at New Salem and New Hope and Mount Olivet and United Church of God in Christ and St. Peter's AME in which we actually provide testing. And so this coming Thursday and Friday and then the following Thursday and Friday, there'll be testing available at uh, Lutheran Church of the Redeemer at 285 Oak Street, I'm uh, not Oak Street, 285 Dale Street. And uh, the, the community uh, involvement there will be with uh, New Hope Baptist Church there as it has been with Mount Olivet. But, so anyway, but uh, when Tony was talking, I wanted to interrupt that I hit the unmute button, whatever, to just ask what country from West Africa was your father from? Gambia. Gambia, aha, okay. Gambia. Well, Tony, Olua Bancoli, that is, uh, that's my name given by my father in the midst of several other names like Alfred Jesse and Babington Johnson, but Olua Bancoli is in the middle. It's a Yoruba name. Uh, my people originally from a Beokuta in uh, West Africa, in, in Nigeria, although he and his, his father moved to uh, Sierra Leone where they, they encamped about. So, so the, the, as Al says, uh, the whole issue of, of recognizing our connectedness to uh, the motherland, the homeland is, is a critical part. And let me just take this opportunity to say, Al, um, and I believe Tony would embrace as well. I, I'm a little concerned about some of the drift of the conversation in our community that tends to try to separate out folks who have uh, been generationally here and others who more recently have come from Africa. As mm -hmm. you say, there's an artificial divide that is uh, self-defeating in that. And I would hope we could recognize that we need to be reaching for more connectedness mm -hmm. uh, and less reasons to, to segregate ourselves because we, we need each other, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, uh, and, and I'm more than impressed, uh, Tony, with the work that you articulated and the spirit from which it comes, because uh, as Al alluded to, for me, the key issue of our times is the breakdown of community. And we define community as the way people uh, be, be, uh, behave when they believe like they belong together, you know, and out of that comes accountabilities and strengths and and all kinds of positive things. But when community is broken down and everybody is in a uh, uh, every tub on its own bottom kind of approach to life, that's cancerous. <laughs> Ultimately, we die right there, you know? So, so somehow we have to continue to strive to, to uh, reignite and invigorate that spirit that says, hey, we're connected, you know? We're better together. You know, and that's that's what stair step is about. Um, I, I used this analogy recently, uh, uh, Al, about uh, a plane that took off. Mm -hmm. They had 500 people on it, large plane, relatively speaking. And uh, shortly after takeoff, the captain comes on to say, "Ladies and gentlemen, I have good news and I have bad news." He said, uh, "The bad news is." We are encountering turbulence such as we've never known. This plane is going down. All 500 people on it, right? They're listening to this report. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. We have 14 parachutes. Hmm. <laughs> it seems to me often we move uh, in that way, you know, not not recognizing the magnitude of the challenge and feeling comforted to say that, well, we're gonna say three <laughs> or 23 or whatever it might be instead of really bending our hearts and our minds to how do we get the, the broad buy-in to community that helps us save us all as we go forward. And I'm hearing in, in, as Tony's description of his approaches, and the things he's doing, I'm hearing that kind of spirit, and I just want to applaud it big time. I, this is a standing ovation. <laughs> Thank you for your leadership, and it means a lot coming from you. Mm -hmm.
So tell me more about Stairs to uh, Bab Bab Brother Babington. You've uh, done, we've done a lot. Uh, talk about some of the things, review that. And I think all of it matters to this conversation about COVID-19 because uh, the, the relationships we have built over a long period of time, in effect, are the ship, the plane that will carry all 500 of us to safe. a safe landing at the other side of this uh, 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 tempest that we are experiencing right now. Amen. And so, Al, you, you know, because you've been with us on this journey from the beginning uh, as an investor in Stair Step, or whatever, you, you uh, aptly said Stair Step Initiative, uh, which uh, we are more and more becoming again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, the Stair Step Initiative focused on this issue of community building, but we began intentionally with two, uh, two streams to the discussion. Uh, one was Stair Step Foundation, which uh, was a, a not-for-profit enterprise and, and to uh, task with the idea of understanding the, the dynamics and the the, the, the pieces that need to come together to reignite community, the software of community. The other was Stair Step Incorporated, which was a for-profit entity in which we sought to have African-American people uh, such as Al as investors in creation of a, of a kind of a holding company with the idea that whatever businesses we were able to launch, the key issues were that everybody, the elephants who were the investors and the management who was going to come to the table and the employees would all benefit by the success of the business. The idea, if it was successful, ESOPs or whatever it is, there would be shared ownership and, a, and a, a, an intentional uh, drawing people to the idea that this is something we're doing together. Interestingly enough, when we put out our uh, offering memorandum, you know, one of the things that the investment bankers tell you is, now, what are you gonna say about the rate of return to the people that are gonna invest? And uh, we talked to some people and Chuck Johnson, uh, Al, who was uh, then at Honeywell as a, one of the first African-American uh, vice presidents, if you will. Um, Chuck Johnson, as we wrestled with that, said, well, Babington, uh, all you can offer since your, your goal is really double barreled is, just say you're going to offer a reasonable rate of return. And in a kind of an unprecedented way, people in our community who had some resources, again, like Al, did invest in Stair Step Incorporated with only the sense that we were going to get a reasonable rate of return. But what we're going to do is try to change our community by empowering uh, folk to recognize that we can be owners. Mm -hmm. Whatever our position is, we, I could be doing the maintenance job, but I'm an owner. Mm -hmm. Everybody, the boiler make all of us. And so that was the spirit in which we went. And we, we early on, we had a, we opened a Dairy Queen uh, franchise and then we opened a Tires Plus franchise. And the moment of greatest impact was a, a, a project we did together with uh, General Mills and Glory Foods out of Columbus, Ohio. We started a manufacturing plant called Cieza. Uh, Cieza meaning uh, we're, we're coming. <laughs> we started this a 65,000 square foot facility, but General Mills was a major investor in Glory Foods, of an African-American firm out of Columbus, Ohio, was a major investor. And for uh, about eight years, we ran this plant. Uh, there were uh, over 400 jobs created, uh, $20 million in payroll and what have you. And, uh, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, national awards and what have you. But quite honestly, Alan, I don't know if I ever talked to you about this, but uh, I, I, if Bill Williams, who was the CEO of Glory Foods, uh, who was a, a remarkable African-American entrepreneur, Bill Williams, I didn't know how ill he was as we launched this thing. Mm -hmm. And about two years in, Bill died. Yep. And Bill was really the one that we were looking at as the business mind to take us forward. I was a convener. Right. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, but it was a great success because it demonstrated our ability to invest with one another, to work together and produce actually dirt going in the hole. Um, and there were other things, but, but that was probably the high point economically at that point. But even now, Al, this, this uh, case investigator thing, we're trying to do that on the ink side, on the for-profit side. <laughs> 
Listen, powerful story, wonderful story. And, uh, you know, I can just tell you that it's been a pleasure to be a part of this work from the beginning, uh, Brother Babington. And you're right. Uh, the I think other investors like me uh, moved into the investment with the idea that uh, there would be a reasonable return. And a reasonable return is actually seeing our people uh, move to a sense of equity, a sense of dignity, a sense of possibility, a sense of belief that we can author author, A-U-T-H-R, a future, write a future in which our people win. And, and, and part of that writing a future is, is redefining what winning is. It's not if I win, you lose. Yeah. When I win, we all win. Everybody wins, right? And so that's part of what I think we have been doing, you have been doing. And I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, so listen, I want to uh, thank both of you so much for what you do and to celebrate and lift up you and the work of your colleagues, your employees, your organization, your stakeholders, and you and your ability to call our people to service, particularly in a time like this, the time of the COVID-19 pandemic, but also the time of the second pandemic. Uh, one of the pastors, one of your colleagues uh, on the program last week, uh, brother from um, uh, the Minneapolis Council of Churches, Curtis DeYoung, Young, Curtis said, DeYoung. said, yeah, we're fighting the COVID-19 virus, but we're also fighting the 1619 pandemic. And so the question of uh, racial justice, of fighting inequity and finding a way to confront the original sin of our country, and that is its... Uh, 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 ability to look past the inhumanity of treating human beings as if they weren't. So anyway, we all are doing that work, I believe, and I want to thank you. And I think that work, as you said, uh, Brother Badminton, is clarified by the pressure uh, being created uh, by COVID-19 because it demands that we examine every detail of our existence and that we be intentional about being safe. Go ahead, Badminton. Yeah, I just want to say this, Al, because it's something that you have modeled for us and that we have to embrace. And that is the narrative. Mm -hmm. We've got to control our own narrative and infuse our people with a recognition that everybody gets to write their own story. Right. You know, And so uh, uh, it, once you embrace that and understand that and start to live with a sense of what the future can be, mm -hmm. what the hope is about, then you don't have to start thinking about, I'm gonna be dead in, in, in six weeks or by, before I'm 24 or whatever. And, and life changes for you and for those around you. And, and Al, again, I wanna say, you have consistently been a champion of the notion that we need to take charge of our own narrative. Hello, uh, 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 McFarland Media Enterprises. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, you brought up the other thing that's important to talk about, and it's important to me. You've identified yourself as, um, through your dad, a Yoruba, and I've identified myself as a Yoruba. I get the DNA, uh, uh, Brother Babington, and it comes back that my uh, family on my mother's side, 99% Yoruba. All right. Now. So I've got the same connection uh, with uh, the Yoruba experience in other parts of Africa and Europe on my father's side. But uh, the connection is important to me. Uh, I go back to uh, Brother Mahmoud El Khadi's uh, description of me, of what uh, uh, remembering is. And when I say, remember this, Babington, you, you know, you think about, did I forget it? Did I remember it? But he said, no, not, not that level. Uh, think about the components of the word remember, mm. think about having been dismembered mm. and think about what happens when we remember wow. the body that was dismembered, remembered. It goes back to what the prophet said, can these dry bones live again? Live again. Look, look, look in the desert and bones strewn everywhere. Can these bones be called to life again? Can they be remembered? Yeah. I think we're on the cusp of a great remembering. Mm. And it's in fact, the Tony Sana experience mm. in the Gambia. It's the Babington Johnson experience in Ghana and through his father in Sierra Leone. It's Alan McFarland's experience in understanding my connections to Cuba, to Jamaica and to Africa. 
uh, this remembering will be the fabric of change, the emergence of a new uh, human being that represents humanity per excellence. That's what I think. I don't know. I do know. That's why I'm saying it. I do know this is the case, and we simply must keep moving forward. Uh, gentlemen, I want to thank you. Brothers, I want to thank you so much. Write your book, going. Al. You promised it. Write your book. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm still working on it. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me of that. You, you mentioned the the, 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 the the divisive idea that's circulating in the community about separating African-Americans from Africans. I think it's an important discussion for us to have because the language being used is ADOS, African descendants of slaves. And it presupposes that we here in the United States are different from anybody else and that we should uh, sort of hoard or that we uh, sort of embrace the fact that we've been separated and, and maligned and marginalized and that we feel a certain kind of way because other people come in and get better treatment, and that's true. But it, it, it says that we embrace that and fight against that or fight claiming that. And the question that you and I are raising is, is that the right strategy? It's a strategy, but is it the right strategy? And maybe the, the more appropriate strategy is to look beyond that, to understand that this is a reflection of the relationship between all Africans and all Europeans in what's called the great Ma'afa, right? The entire 500 hundred year history of Europeans colonizing uh, Africans. Uh, and so that's a discussion we have to have as well. Tony, are you hearing that at all? Uh, this question about whether somebody's a, an immigrant, uh, it, it suggests competition, for example, between Caribbeans or between Africans that come here or between Somalis. How do we get beyond that? Yeah, well, I think the system you know, has caused, you know, to, to marginalize our communities and, and um, have us fighting for resources um, separately instead of together. Um, and, you know, I think it was intentionally done. Um, and so I, we have to, you know, be inviting and we need to learn more about each other. And, you know, there, there are some places where, where especially when there's influx of, of any community, um, you know, and, and let's not mistake it, even in, 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 you know, what we would consider, you know, African-Americans born in this country, people born in the South move up, up here, um, you know, people get territorial and they, and they fight for, for, for themselves instead of being inviting. And at the end of the day, I used to preach this when I was playing soccer and I, I believed in, in, in speaking up to management and speaking up on behalf of all players. And some players, you know, had a contract and sat in the corner. And I would be like, you can do that and you'll be okay until you're not okay. <laughs> you know, we need to stand up and, and fight for each other, whether it's benefiting us individually, because if it's not benefiting one of us as a people, it's not benefiting any of us. Right. And I, th I think we have been trapped and we isn't just black folk, it's almost like a universal trap into being reactive. Mm -hmm. You know, we're reactive and, and, and the reactiveness makes us smaller as opposed to being proactive, as opposed to becoming dreamers and those who seek to fulfill the dream. You know, one of the things that I'm most grateful for that we're doing right now, Al, working with the church and whatever is uh, a program that we created with the black psychologists to uh, deal, it's called choosing life in the black community, achieving the dream. And it's, uh, it's a curriculum that we give that, that, that um, contends with trauma, but more than that, it contends with the, the false notion uh, that, that traps us, you know, because there's two streams to it. One is the cognitive behavioral stuff. So you understand trauma and what are emotions and all that. But the other is social network theory, you know, uh, the thing that Tony lives out in terms of being on teams, it, it, you know, being really on a team makes you bigger. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, you start to recognize that the power of the team, you know, let me say this now. When I first came to Minneapolis, uh, I uh, this is back in the 68s and 9s, 
I was on a touch football team and everybody on my team, all black, everybody had either been a pro player or a collegiate all-star except me, right? Okay. And, but we were all black and all star. And we played in this park league. And may I share with you, we didn't win a game in the whole season. Not one. Because everybody was a star. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and we were playing these teams from Duffy's Tavern or whatever. And they were playing teamwork. And they were eating our lunch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so somewhere we need to recognize that we get bigger by connecting, you know, and, and stop going for the okie doke that has us trying to be so, as Tony said, territorial, you know. Well, you know, let's close this out. I want to thank Carmen Robles, who's uh, producing this series for me. And thanks uh, to Brenda Gray, who's doing the, the writing, the documentation of the program. Thanks to the Minneapolis, Minnesota Department of Health for underwriting the series. Uh, I think Carmen asked both of you if you had a quote or a saying that you wanted to end the show with. And if you do, now's the time. Let me go to uh, uh, Brother Babington first. Uh, any thought or... Carmen, who is an exceptional one, did not present this to me, notwithstanding. <laughs> I shall say, choose life. Choose life. Choose life. Excellent. Tony, what, what comes to mind? Um, well, one thing is what, what you know, Mr. Babington said, and um, it was, um, you know, having a team of stars. I believe that we all are stars, but we have to play together. Mm -hmm. And so, as one great president once said, when we win, we win. Oh, yeah. All right. There we go. Listen, guys, thank you so much for, for what you're doing. Keep up the good work. And we're going to be doing this every day at noon from now till uh, December 31. Hopefully, uh, this will be of value to our community, to our people, and to the public at large. Perhaps we could continue this into the next year because we know the problem is going to be here. In fact, the problem will simply escalate the uh, fallout, the escalation expected from the Thanksgiving uh, vacations and the relax of community, uh, uh, the cre cre increase in community spread uh, that likely will happen again uh, over the Christmas and New Year's holiday. Uh, we all are hopeful that uh, both new therapies and vaccines will come. We have to talk about how our people are going to respond to that because there's the same kind of discussion, uh, Brother Babington, uh, where people are wondering if it's going to be safe. We've got a, a history of uh, being skeptical of what the institution or the state uh, does with research and, and medicines and their policy. I mean, we have these disparities in health because, not because of us so much, but because of institutions, uh, uh, again, uh, devaluing our humanity and our existence. So we've got a lot to talk about. So perhaps this thing can go beyond as we try to create what I call a public mind in our community that allows us to envision sustainability and prosperity as a defining characteristic of our existence. Listen, thank you so much. And we'll see you next time. God bless you. Thank, thank you. you. Nice Thanks. to meet you, man. Nice to meet you and I'm honored. All right.